So welcome, Maria. Hello, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I really, really um, feel privileged to, to be introduced into this wonderful networking group um, that is so passionate about pushing the agenda on well-being, which I've been interested in since I won my first um, award for um, developing technology in well-being, which was back in 1997. So um, I've been in this you know, I've been in this space developing technology to measure well-being and then kind of waiting. And for a long time, nothing happened. It was just the tumbleweed blowing by. But uh, but it's so great to, to see how many people are now really getting engaged and seeing the benefits of being involved in well-being. And my own personal story does also kind of relate very much to this concept of neurodiversity because I am myself neurodiverse. I have the certificate to prove it. So I'm, um, I have been diagnosed with, um, diagnosed, well, let's call it diagnosed. So diagnosed with um, autistic spectrum condition. So we prefer the word condition to disorder because I see it as a difference. Um, I'm going to just steal one of Sarah's wonderful ideas. Sarah, I'm going to credit you. So you're getting your name in brackets with a date after it. Um, because Sarah often says to me, I really don't like the word inclus inclusiveness because inclusiveness is, is this impression that we're a club and we're gonna let you in. Um, and uh, so I'm completely taking this from Sarah, but Sarah's idea is it's more about enrichment and enrichment is, we're a club and we really need you. Come on, come in, we need you to enrich us. So I really love that concept. And it actually kind of sits really nicely with the way I feel about neurodiversity, not only as somebody who is neurodiverse, but also looking at all the ways in which neurodiversity, the broad idea of neurodiversity can totally benefit all of our lives and our organizations and our businesses in every way. So I want to start by just getting you to think about this. Um, if you don't already identify yourself as neurodiverse, you may be here already with that. Um, what would you consider to be neurotypical? So if somebody said to you, describe yourself as a neurotypical person, what would you say? What would make you neurotypical? And I think when we start asking that question, it makes us realize that there are massive assumptions that we make about what is normality and what is the way, what is the rational way to behave or what is the accepted wisdom on behavior. So if you can't describe what neurotypical is, it makes it kind of a little bit challenging to think about what actually is difference. And what we're really looking at here is this, an idea that it is about the way in which I have to explain who I am. So if when we achieve real diversity, I will know that I won't have to explain what it is to be me. Um, and what it is to be me is not going to be the same as what it is to be other people who are neurodiverse, I might add. There are lots of variations in that. We are all unique human beings. Um, but there are certainly elements which, where there are crossovers. And I think it's also worth bearing in mind, um, I'll talk a little bit about, and you might find some of these things start really resonating with you. Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that when we're looking at this concept of neurodiversity, even though we can talk about it in terms of it being a variation in human brain, and we know that there are genes that are specific to autism, and I'm studying with um, uh, the uh, King's College London at the moment, I'm studying neuroscience with them because I never get enough of it. And, um, and one of the things that I've been having this kind of huge debate about is, well, do we actually want to do anything about changing the genes? You know, do we, do we need to do gene therapy? Because actually, I, I'm not sure that by losing autism in the um, population, we're doing ourselves a favor. And I think it's really important as well to think that when we consider neurotypical, are we really thinking about an environment within which you feel most comfortable, as opposed to a real way of processing? I think a lot of neurotypical is about being comfortable in the environment that we call work. And so we may need to think about whether that environment is something that we can change rather than trying to get people to change, whether we can be more adaptive in the way that we work, the way that we expect people to interact within that environment, 
even the physical environment that we're working in, but also the matrices of relationships which create the environment as well, a really important aspect, the co-regulation that we have between each other within the environment. So neurodiversity generally is looking at people whose brains are slightly different when it comes to sociability, learning, attention, mood, and other kinds of things which are non-pathological, um, so it's not an illness. It comes from a develop it's a developmental condition. It's, it's something you don't develop, but actually you often don't see it until later in life. And some aspects of neurodiversity don't even seem to pop up until in your, you're in your 20s. Um, I've clearly been neurodiverse my entire life. Um, and um, I won't go into too much detail on that, but you're welcome to ask me anything you like, but I clearly have been. Um, but there wasn't very much recognition of women or girls as being neurodiverse. So there's a very huge under diagnosis among women. So that's worth bearing in mind as well. Um, just because somebody doesn't have the di diagnosis doesn't mean that we can't be sensitive to their needs. Um, so that it develops in childhood and adolescence very often. Um, and because of that, uh, that lack of diagnosis among women, the, the idea of neurodiversity has often kind of gravitated towards the male presentation. Um, I'm going to be, because I'm neurodiverse, I can say this, the male and the female presentation are quite different than children. And the easiest way to put it, and this is completely reductionist, so I know that, is that girls who are um, autistic tend to present like boys, and boys who are present, uh, autistic tend to present like very geeky boys. So just in a very broad reductionist way, there's a way to kind of think about it. Um, and certainly that was very much how I presented, very much more in the way that boys play with boys, that's how I would play. Um, and even my interests. So hence I'm involved in technology. Um, I'm involved in science, uh, but gosh, it was a blooming struggle to get into there. I can tell you it's been difficult, it's not been easy. Um, but anyway, that aside, that aside. So there are a number of things that you can think of as neurodiverse. Um, I'll give you some examples. Autism is the one that we often think about. There are some big differences between people that are diagnosed with autism and people who are autistic spectrum condition, which we used to call Asperger's syndrome. Do you might have heard of Asperger's syndrome? Some people still like to call themselves Aspie. It's, you know, it's a pet name that they like, that's fine. Um, I consider all of us to be the A-team, just saying. Um, among those, there are other things as well, like dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia. You probably heard of these things. ADHD, which is, you may know, attention, dis um, attention deficit dis hyperactive disorder, which is another kind of part of this um, kind of picture. But what I want to really tell you about is this idea that this it's actually all about our processing and that it is actually a broader picture than we very often realize. So even though there are all of these different elements and there's also things like bipolar, we might want to think about Tourette syndrome as well. Um, there are other things, for example, I have a comorbidity as they call it, um, which is called prosopagnosia. That means I have something called face blindness. So if you change your hairstyle, I won't know who you are. So even if I've known you for 20 years, I mean, I didn't recognize my daughter once, she was absolutely furious about it, but anyway. Um, but that is, that's another processing, um, brain processing uh, thing. And then you can see I'm very technical. Another thing which, and this is, I think a really good example actually to just get you thinking about it. And that's color blindness. So people often think color blindness is your eyes not working properly. It's not, it's your brain processing differently. I have a family of people who are all somewhere on the spectrum of neurodiversity. My eldest son has a profound red green colorblind deficiency. So his ability to differentiate between red and green is really, really difficult. Um, and he will see yellow things as green and green things as yellow sometimes. Interestingly, he's a scriptwriter and filmmaker and film director. So, it doesn't mean that he can't do something with the visual arts. He's always been interested in the visual arts, but he brings something quite different. He also is dyslexic, surprise, surprise, you know, all of these things tend to go together. So the interesting thing is his approach is so different. And if you want to look him up, I'm just giving him a plug now, I don't know why, Cole Pavia. Um, he's done some really groundbreaking work 
um, in in-camera effects. So rather than using CGI, actually using cameras to do amazing things. And this is the sort of thing that happens when you have people that are neurodiverse. It's the ability to think in a slightly different quirky way. Sometimes it can be really ridiculous. Sometimes it can be brilliant. So, you know, you, 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 you have to sort of take the good with the bad, if you like. But the key thing here is this is about the fact that our brains are processing things slightly differently. So it is very much a processing um, thing. Again, my, my, um, using my, my technical terminology. But I want you to think about this in a slightly broader way because there is a condition or a thing, we don't really call it a condition, um, known as um, highly sensitive person. It's not a syndrome because about 20% of the population are highly sensitive people. It is called also sensory processing sensitivity. Now, highly sensitive people being 20%, we can't start putting them into diagnosis. It's too many of them. But highly sensitive people are really important because they are part of our survival mechanism as a group of people. And what's interesting is 20% of populations tend to be highly sensitive. So for example, 20% of the population of deer will be highly sensitive. So they will have this capability. Yay, thank you, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte's just come out and said, I'm HSP, yes. Um, this is a really important trait. If you've got 20% you've got of deer saying, we will process much more because we're much more capable of processing sensitive things. Um, actually, 20% of fruit flies are highly sensitive. So you have highly sensitive fruit flies. Um, it's, you know, it's really ubiquitous and what we tend to think is that we're focusing towards the 80% who are not highly sensitive. Now that 80% are very important, the get adapt donors, people, that's all important. But without the highly sensitive people, they are likely to go running off into the meadow like Bambi, the meadow, off into the meadow without a thought as to the potential risks. So what's great about highly sensitive people is they will see detail, all sorts of detail, that you might otherwise miss. And it might not be the detail that you think that they should see, and that's the other thing, because they'll often pick up on things which are a bit different from what you would imagine. So when we're thinking about neurodiversity, we need to think about it in terms of a broader picture rather than narrowing it down to what do we do for that person who's got ASC. We need to be thinking, how do we make the environment an environment that is enriching for all of our different thinking types? And that includes the people who would identify as being introverted. And if you haven't read Susan Cain's book or seen her lecture, TED Talk, definitely look at, um, what's it called? The Power of the Introvert or something like that. It's great because this is exactly what she's talking about. The people who are sitting in the meeting who aren't speaking, aren't there not contributing. Their contribution just isn't the same as everybody else's contribution. Their contribution is in listening and in processing. So we need to take the time to create an environment that isn't necessarily like a meeting, that will allow those people to be able to share their wisdom and be able to bring it all together to create that enriching environment that will support us all. So there, those are my main kind of thoughts, really. Um, I think the few things in the very, very quick um, time that I've got, a little bit of time I've got, and you can, you can give me a countdown if you want me to get up. Um, some things to think about is with, with people that are neurodiverse, the social situation needs to be rethought. Going into a networking room is very, very different from some, for somebody who's, so, um, who's neurodiverse. People think, people will say to me, you're so confident. Oh, you can get up on stage and talk. Yeah, I can do that because it's quite a bit of gap. Walking into a networking room, my brain will start going to overdrive. If there's coffee and tea available, I will be worrying about how I actually manipulate that, how I actually walk on the floor because I'll be bothered about the floor and the lighting. And I'll be thinking a little bit like from the door, imagine going underwater and you need to find somewhere to get some oxygen. So I will be looking for someone I, can, I know, and when I get to that person, I can get my oxygen. And then I will look for somebody else. 
that's what it's like going into a networking room. It really feels like you might not have enough oxygen. So it's, it, that's the kind of thinking we need to rethink the structures that we use. Giving you three little things I think you can do. Kindness. Okay, just be really sensitive to different ways of thinking. Everyone's different. Let's just respect that. It's really easy. Just be kind. So before you start thinking, oh, God, they're on it again, just wind in all of that judgment and roll out the kindness. Secondly, don't project. What you feel is not necessarily what someone else feels. And that includes sensitivity. People often think I'm sensitive things about things that I'm not in the least bit sensitive about. I really will take any amount of feedback and it can be really harsh. Doesn't bother me. But other people feel really worried about that. So don't project. Some of the things I find easy, you may find hard. But some of the hard things you think are hard, I might find easy. So don't project. And thirdly, the third one is accept rather than assume. So let go of some expectations of what is normal, because there is more than one road to any destination.